Psalm 113. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, here we are. Okay, there we go. So Psalm 113 is, is just pure praise to the Lord. You know, a lot of us, we, uh, we kind of approach the Lord in, in praise and worship, um, kind of buttering him up <laughs> so we can bring our requests to him. But Lord, this thing's going on, and I really, you know, and there's nothing really wrong with that. That is a biblical way to do things. But uh, this psalmist asks for nothing in this praise. It says, praise the Lord, praise, O servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. So he starts, and he's going to kind of walk us through an instruction about giving praise to the Lord, but uh, he starts it out with, guess what? Praise the Lord. He is the who of all praise. He's the only one who is worthy. He's the only one that is uh, acceptable that we should praise him. And uh, it, it says, praise him, O servants of the Lord. That's, that's us. We, we should be praising him. Uh, praise his name. And of course, in the Old Testament, anytime you see that his name thing, it's, it's pointing to his nature, his character. We're praising him for who he is. He's the creator, you know. He is the sustainer of life. He is the faithful one. He is the loving one, the long-suffering one, the one full of mercy and full of grace, you know. How could you ever improve upon the God that we read about in the scriptures? I mean, I'm always blown away when I read about what he's done and who he is and how he looks at me and, and how he's rescued me. I'm like, I, I couldn't add a single thing to who he is. It says in verse 2, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forevermore. So if you haven't been praising him, right, then from this moment on, you should begin that walk. We should let praise mark the rest of our lives. You know, as many days as we have on this planet, should be marked by that. Verse three, it says, from the rising of the sun to its going down, the, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So in other words, there's two ways to look at this. One of the ways to look at this is from the moment your eyes pop open in the morning, three o'clock, you know, well, whatever it is, until the moment your eyes close, every waking hour, praising, worshiping, bringing adoration, thinking about, you know, being in that place. But another way to look at that is from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. It's from east to west. You know, it's from the, it's under the sun no matter where the sun is. Uh, our praise of the, of the Lord and his name and who he is should be happening. You know, it's kind of like saying, let the whole world praise his name. Verse 4, the Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. However great a nation becomes, you know, we're the world's superpower. We're the last remaining superpower. We've got all of the, you know, we love the USA. It's great. Even in the present decline that it's going through, it's still, you know, the best nation out there as far as I'm concerned. But we know that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we study through his word and we discover who he really is, what he's done, how he's stepped out of heaven and come down and rescued us and taken our sin and paid for it and welcomed us in freely, undeservedly into his presence, you know, he is still all of that today. You know, nations come and go. Nations, you know, rise up and they disappear and they, and they do all of these things. So, but God is above all nations. He's not restricted by law or politics or anything man comes up with. Our little schemes are, well, this is legal now. And that's illegal and this is wrong and this is right. You know, none of that human government doesn't overcome him. He overcomes human government. And... Um, he has plans, he has purposes, and those things are going to happen in spite of whatever 
this physical world and whatever these human governments can do, and his glory can't even be contained in the heavens. I love the way it says, you know, this universe that he created, he is greater than the universe. The creator is always greater than what is created, right? You guys know that, you know, you go home, you make, make a batch of cookies. Oh, that's the best batch of cookies I've ever made. Are, are you greater than those cookies? Yes, you know. So uh, he's, the, he's the uncreated one, and in some ways the unrestricted one. Verse 5, it says, Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? Who can you compare the Lord with? Nothing and no one is like him in all of creation. You know, this psalmist, as you walk through this psalm, you know, this guy is in love with the Lord. He's not missing out on anything by being a believer. You know, our world would tell us, oh, you Christians, you're missing out on such a good time over here and such a, you know, you don't know what you're missing. Well, thank goodness for that. I, I don't want to know what I'm missing. Thanks, because I don't believe I'm missing anything, just like the psalmist is. In verse 6, notice this. Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heaven and in the earth. God, our Lord, our Master, our Maker, our Creator, humbles himself to behold his creation. Here the psalmist is praising God because he humbles himself. Because he looks into our hearts, he looks into our lives, he's interested in us. How would God so condescend that he would come down and speak with me, or listen to me, or pay attention to me, or bless me, you know? How amazing it is that God would do such a thing. And how that should shake us. It should really get our attention. Almighty God is taking note of you. He's listening to your prayers. He's watching your heart. He's paying attention to the circumstances that surround you. He's got all of that, you know, he, our condition, our need. He provides, he blesses, he cares, he works for, he listens, you know. He has concern for us, and that should kind of blow our mind. But then it just goes back to that great verse in the Bible, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world and the world, in that case, is always pointing to you, me, not, not this physical thing, but us. God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How humbling that God would give his son for us. You know, in Philippians 2.5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself. Don't you love that? He comes down, he takes on the form of a what? A slave? Bondservant? And then being found like this, and being found in a human body, he goes, well, I'm just going to humble myself again and become obedient, even to the point of the death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2.5. That idea that God so humbled himself and God so loves us is like alive and well in my life. I look at that and I think about that because he demonstrates his care for me over and over and over again in so many ways. I live with it. I walk with it, you know. It's there all the time. I'm so blessed. I'm so cared for. I am so loved. And the fact that Jesus came, that Jesus, the Father sent Jesus to us, and that he paid it all. And once you accept that, then you're welcomed in freely, undeservedly. 
You didn't have to earn it. You don't have to do good works for it. You don't have to do, go through any of that stuff. And now, far greater than this psalmist's idea, God now lives in me. That, that's just mind-blowing. His Holy Spirit inside directing and leading and teaching and gifting and transforming. Should we not all be praising God? Because every day we walk around in that condition. Every day we have a God that is totally overseeing our lives, our walk, our heart, our thoughts, our direction, you know? We should, we should be bringing up praises from the deepest places in our heart. Because he came, he humbled himself so low just to save you and me. Just to rescue us from our world. He raises the poor out of the dust. He lifts the needy out of the ash heap. God brings significance to our lives that we would never understand in any other setting. He gives us a higher meaning and a higher purpose in life than where we were before. Isn't that true? When you feel like calling on your life, don't you understand that, man, I'm here on purpose and God wants to use me somewhere and I'm kind of looking for it and how could I affect these guys and how do I pray for them and well, how could I help these? And then in verse 8 it says, that he may seat him with princes and with the princes of his people. He elevates us to royal status. You know, you, we're not just a priesthood in the New Testament. Not happening. We are a royal household, a royal priesthood, you know, because we have entered into a royal household, his household. He's invited us in. And then in verse 9, it says, He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. He brings a joy and he brings a fruitfulness to our lives that we would have never known otherwise. Have a joy-filled spiritual family that I never had when I wasn't saved. You know, I got to hang out with one of my brothers this weekend or this, you know, went and saw Pastor Gordon and I was telling him about our our little project out here and told him, hey, you know, I need some way to get this metal up here and do this thing. And he calls me on Monday morning, hey, go load of metal on the truck. Where are we going, you know? And so he just pulls in and we spend a half an hour, 40 minutes, kind of like old times in my brain, you know, it's been so long since I hung out with this brother of mine. And yet, right there, right together, you know, just loving each other. And it was so awesome, you know. I have a thousand people like that. And I went to Water Springs this weekend and there was just people that just come out of the way, hey, you're Mark, hey, where are you? Hey, what's going on up there? We've been praying for you, you know, and just, and it's like, where do you get all of that stuff? You get that in the Lord. You don't get that anywhere else. You don't have any coworkers go, man, I've been praying for you. I treat you like a brother. You know, you don't have many people like that. I got, I got hundreds of them. They're everywhere. And that's all because the loyal the Lord gave it to me, you know? So he raises us. He lifts us. He sits with us. He, he grants us. I, I, I love those words, you know? This is the first psalm of the, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Hillel Psalms. Uh, there were four psalms, five psalms, verse, or Psalm 113 through 118 were the Hillel Psalms, and they were sung at Passover. This would have been sung by Jesus, this psalm, would have been sung by Jesus the night they took the Passover in the upper room, just before Calvary. And in, Mark, in Matthew 26, it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This was probably the hymn they sang. The great humility of God. To be willing to be born into the sin-filled world. And the whole reason for it? You. Me. 
That is divine humility in his birth, in his incarnation. But oh, how humbling was the cross going there, being mocked and beaten, rejected, whipped, spit upon, nailed to that cross. He's nailed to that cross, and as they're nailing him, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How humbling is that? <laughs> the humility it would take to forgive your, sin, your, your people that are killing you right then on the spot. And to have the sins of the whole world placed upon him while on that cross. And then for the Father to pour out all of his holy wrath, everything your sin and my sin and my life deserved on him and paid in full. <laughs> and it says about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You ever think that through? Here's the second person of the Holy Trinity. This one God and three eternal persons, and suddenly one of them is outside that circle. The Father and the Son have never been separated, and suddenly there's a separation. Where'd you go, God? Where'd you go, Dad? Where'd you go, Father? Why, why'd you leave me? <laughs> How humbling God became just for you and me. And then to further humble himself, God comes and dwells inside you and me. Forgiven, washed, cleansed, but still sinners. <laughs> Tell me I'm not true. And yet he's right there with us. You know, in John 5, 39, it, Jesus talking, it says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. Hebrews 10, 7, it says, then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. All of these Old Testament passages are Jesus. All of them. You should see Jesus on every page. You should probably see him in every story, every illustration. Because the whole Old Testament is telling you about his name, his nature, who he is, what he has done for us. Oh, praise for, should flow from us, the partakers of him, his divine plan his divine payment, his divine pay ticket into heaven, and his divine spirit that now dwells in us. Psalm 114 is a celebration of God's power demonstrated in the Exodus for the Old Testament people. This, this redemption of Israel out of Egypt was the greatest deliverance in the Old Testament. They looked at that as the greatest work God ever did for Israel. It's the second of the Hillel Psalms, uh, sung at Passover, celebrating to them. What was Passover celebrating? Oh yeah, the deliverance, right? The night when the death angel came in and went through the camp and killed all of the firstborns except where the blood of the lamb was. It's the single greatest miracle in their history but it's all just a type and a picture for us in the New Testament because it's comparable to our salvation day. Remember that day? I do. <laughs> I remember that day. God sending his deliverer to deliver you from this world, you know. Jesus delivered us out of the bondage of this world, out of the sin, and, and has brought us into the kingdom. And now... Six of eight of these verses in this psalm speak of nature, and only two of them speak of people, because the psalmist is trying to tell us 
that nature is no obstacle for God to fulfill his promises. We sometimes look at things and we go, well, that's impossible. That could never really happen. You know, we do that all the time, totally forgetting, oh, there's a creator that's outside of all of this stuff that can do anything at any time he wants to do it. You know, all of these things that we look at humanly and say that's impossible, that's not an obstacle at all to God. So verse one, it says, not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. Am I in the right psalm? Oh, I skipped ahead. Better get 114 in here. Let's read 114 first, right? When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from the people of a strange language. This is the Exodus, Israel's moving day. The, the people of a strange language, the Babylonians, they're, they're not speaking Hebrew. You know, they're speaking Babel, according to the, what the Hebrews heard. They just heard Babel, 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 Babel. You know, they didn't hear concise words. Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. Judah, that's the tribe that surrounded the area where the Temple Mount was. Southern Israel. And Israel, governed by God, is what Israel means, that became his dominion. Now, understand this. We just talked about this. This is all pictures. This is all types for us because we are now Israel. Oh, not physically. But you are now governed by God, are you not? You ever wrestle with God over some things? You know, something's going on and you have this little wrestling match with God? You're just like Jacob who he renamed Israel because now you're governed by God. <laughs> Verse three, in some very poetic language, the sea saw it and fled, the Jordan turned back. You remember, you know, they're in the Exodus, they're headed out and they get to the Red Sea and the sea saw it and fled. <laughs> the sea saw what and fled? We're going to find out the sea saw the presence of the Lord and got out of the way. You know? And then on the day they entered the land, you remember what happened to the Jordan River? It's at flood stage. They put the ark on those guys' shoulders, and as soon as they stepped one step into the waters, the Jordan stopped. And it stopped somewhere upstream by a place called Sin. <laughs> It's always interesting to me in the Bible how it stopped at sin. <laughs> and they crossed on dry ground again. In verse 4, the mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like lambs. Now it's speaking of Sinai when he spoke to them the law. And you can imagine the voice. It, you know, Philadelphia, I've been there a handful of times, is about one and a half million people in Philadelphia. God's speaking to two and a half million people here at the Exodus, surrounding this mountain. Some, some commentators think that the, the camp of God was 500 square miles. He speaks with his voice and it thunders and his presence is shaking this mountain. There's an earthquake going on, you know. And he, he says, he, he equates it to like a flock of sheep. You ever see a flock of sheep running across a hillside and it looks like the hill's moving, you know. Or you, you see the elk, you know, and they're running through the dark forest and all you catch is the movement behind the trees sometimes. But it still looks like the whole scene is moving. And then in verse 5 and 6, it says, What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? O mountains, that you skipped like rams? O little hills, like lambs? The psalmist asks, he looks at nature and he goes, What was your problem there? What's going on? Why are you shaking? Why are you quaking? Why are you moving out of the way? Why did you do what you did? It's so unnatural for waters to split, right? form these big walls. 
That's pretty unnatural. It's so unnatural for water to just heap up down there at sin. What's going on there? It's pretty unnatural for mountains like Sinai to just begin to shake and rumble and move around. And then verse 7, what's the explanation? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Moses, you remember Moses, he, he took the, the, the rod of Aaron and he went out towards the Red Sea and he held up the staff. And when he held up the staff, the waters parted. It wasn't Moses and it wasn't the staff. The Lord had told Moses, he had told the people, I will go before you who crossed the Red Sea first. I always think that's funny. When they entered and the, the priests walked up to the Jordan River and they put their, they got their feet wet in the Jordan and the Jordan heaped up. Who went before them? At Mount Sinai, who was speaking? Who was there before them in that presence? You know. <laughs> Verse 8. Who turned the rock into a pool of water the flint into a fountain of waters. You know, it speaks of when the, the Lord, you know, he told Moses, hey, take that stick and go up and beat and smite the rock and smite it twice, you know. And so he smites the rock and it breaks in half and this river of waters comes flowing out of this flinty rock out there and creates these giant pools where two and a half million people and all their herds can get a drink. And the drink lasts for four to 38 years. So it's, it's quite interesting how that works you know we have a saying in our in america you know i'm going to move heaven and earth to get this done now that's a curious saying because we have no power to move heaven and we we have very little power to move earth but it's just a way of saying you know we're going to use our supreme effort to do whatever it is we tell you we're going to do but god doesn't share our limitations and when he makes a promise and it involves his people he will literally move heaven and earth to make that promise happen and, and I love that because I know his future promises. I know they're coming. <laughs> and, and I kind of get a little excited at that, about that because he's going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Psalm 115. This appears to have been written when the Jews are returning from Babylon. You know, they've been there for 70 years because of their idolatry, because of their rebellion against God. But as they return, they are very much aware that they did not cause their return to happen. That this is some supernatural thing. This is, this is a God thing that Babylon would let them go and let them come back to Israel. So the psalmist gives glory to the Lord, knowing full well that it's God's mercy, it's his grace, it's his truth that brings them back. He says in verse 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, So where is their God? So as they're returning, they have a problem. The Gentiles who have moved into the land in the 70 years that they moved out have taken over everything. And uh, they're worshiping pagan gods, doing all kinds of rituals and all kinds of things. And as the Jews return, they begin to speak of how they worship the unseen God, the invisible God. And the pagans begin to mock them about that. <laughs> Where's your God, O Israel? You know, ours is over here. You know, ours is that carved thing right there. And, the, you know, or ours is over here. I got a little God at home. You know, I carry him around in my pocket. I got a little plastic Jesus on the dashboard of my car. We're good. You know, whatever it is. And um, 
So Psalm 115 is, is God's reply to their mocking. It's reply to their, to their godless ways from those who have faith in an invisible God, an unpowerful God, an omnipresent God in whom we trust. So he says, you know, because of your mercy, the reason we're coming back into the land, because you've shown us mercy. Oh, we didn't deserve it. We're guilty as sin, but what does mercy do? It eliminates the guilt. And just receives you for who you are. It's, it's because of your truth. Why is it because of your truth? Because God had told them 70 years before, I'm sending you out for 70 years, but then I'm going to bring you back. And it's interesting when you study it, he sent them out for exactly 70 years. <laughs> Notice verse 3, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Notice the contrast he brings up. Our God is in heaven. Yours is simply the best carvings and best things that the world has to offer. It's so sad that some people have to make their own God and then, and then make them out of something valuable like gold or silver so it gives them the impression that they're valuable. This is a very valuable God. Why? Because he's gold. That doesn't make him valuable. You know, They're trying to convince themselves that it's valuable because of what they made it of. And, and this story at Isaiah 40, 44, um, always cracks me up because... Isaiah says, here's this guy. And he goes out and cuts down cedars for himself. <sighs> then he uses a part of it to put in the fireplace to heat up the, the wood stove to warm himself by. And then he takes some of it and he kindles another fire and he bakes bread with it. And he eats meat, he roasts a roast and is satisfied, he even warms himself and says, oh, I am warm, I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god. And he falls down before it and worships it. Prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my god. And they do not understand. For he has shut his eyes so that they cannot see and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned half of this thing in the fire. Oh yeah, I baked some bread on its coals, you know? I've roasted my meat and eaten it, and shall I make the rest an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. He cannot deliver his soul, soul, nor say, there is not a lie in my right hand. In verse 5, the psalmist begins to mock these idols. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. You, know, you start to read through this and you start to begin to get the idea that these, guys, these things are good for nothing. They have all of these created things that don't work. Noses they have, they don't smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. He doesn't even say they can't speak. He says, we can't get any noise out of this thing at all. But notice verse 8. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. This is the kicker. This is the main point. The Bible teaches that every single individual on planet Earth is a worshiper. Period. Hmm. That, practically speaking, 
says there is no such thing as an atheist. That is God's opinion, would you call it? Hmm. You know, we hear a lot about atheists today. It's become the, the great rebellious standalone, I'm standing on my intellect, I'm standing on what I can see, I'm standing on, you know, whatever it is. And uh, <clears throat> they're thought to be very wise, very high and lofty, you know, it's all of these famous people. But what you've got to understand is that as much as they don't believe in God, God does not believe in them. And that's kind of scary if you're one of them. You know, that's a bigger problem for them. God knows there is no such thing as an atheist. Oh, that guy is worshiping something. It might be his intellect. It might be his mentor who taught him to think this way. It might be, you know, whatever it is. All you've got to do is identify what the master passion of their life is, and you have found their God. <laughs> it's the one thing that has captured their heart, that has captured their soul, that has captured all of their strength. It's the one thing that excites them, that, that gets them out of bed in the morning. It's what you think about the most. Where does your discretionary income go? Big pointer there. Answer that, you have found their God. <laughs> it can be money, it can be sports, you know, it can be power, it can be sex, it can be education, it can be science, it can be work, it can be self, it can be entertainment, it can be food, it doesn't matter. It's something. Sage teaches us that we all have a God. Every one of us. Everybody ever born on planet Earth. And the bigger point, we are becoming like that God. That's either scare, should scare you to death or make you super excited. We become more and more like the God we worship every day. So here we have, in this illustration, we have a bunch of people making gods, idols. And we know that creation is always less than the creator, so if it's man-made, it's less than man. And we're bowing down to that. We're worshiping that, you know. You're worshiping something less than yourself. That's illogical. Why would you do that? Here's the thing, when you start to follow or believe in some idol, some God, something other than God of the Bible, your ears will stop listening, stop hearing, and you might put truth in there. Your mouth will stop speaking truth. Your hands will stop working for truth. Your feet will start, stop walking towards truth. You will stop seeing or searching for truth. This is why so many that get involved in the cults stay in the cults because they can't see truth anymore. All they're used to is seeing lies and that's all they see because they can't see, they can't hear. They can't touch, feel. They can't connect with it because most of us connect through the five senses, don't we? All of these five senses, they ain't working in people like that. Or if they leave, they go, well, that wasn't true, so nothing must be true, and they walk away from everything, right? Hmm. That is a sad lie. The greatest tragedy of idolatry Worship of anything other than the God described to us in the Bible, made real to us through salvation and through our relationship with, is that those who worship them become like them. They become empty and useless 
spiritually. <laughs> the ultimate potential of your mouth that God gave it, never to be used. The ultimate potential of your ears, of your eyes, of your hands, of your walk, of your life is wasted. Well, that's a powerful psalm. And you just sit down and you start thinking through that. Their life becomes as useless and as futile as a little carved figurine. You know, Paul, talking in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, we know that an idol is nothing. This little thing is nothing. Nothing. And that there are no other gods but one. There is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, because you talk to people and they speak about all kinds of other gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. Notice how he describes him, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone this understanding, this knowledge. Did you catch that? He's describing one God and he, he brings up two individuals. You know, I can find that in many, many places in my Bible. You know, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. That you might understand the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. It's the knowledge and the mystery not of God's, plural, but of one God who is Father and Son. And then you find out that the Holy Spirit doesn't really speak of himself, but he's called God in the Bible over and over and over again. And suddenly you have three in one. There is one God eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So for the believer, this is verse is full of hope. You know why it's full of hope for us? Because we become like the God we worship. God told us, you know, there's one God. You should worship only that God. You shouldn't make molded images or molten images or any of this artistic stuff. And we always, we always take that and go, well, I haven't poured anything into a mold and I haven't done this and I haven't done that. I haven't engraved one, you know, I haven't done all of that. And yet in your mind, you do that every day. You make this little image of God and you pour God in there and you go, this is what I picture you as today. We're never to do that. Only as far as his word instructs us about who he is. So, you know, we, we will never come with perfect worship. We will simply come with informed worship. I worship my creator. He is this. He is that. His word tells me that. Therefore, I know this about him. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we are becoming conformed to his image. I like that. You know, Second Corinthians um, 3.18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What's happening every day from glory to glory, from moment to moment, we are being transformed. Take captive every thought, every imagination. <laughs> I like that. So anyway, now because so much is at stake because of what he's built up here, and the psalmist exhorts us to trust in the Lord. He says in verse 9, where was I? There I am. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The psalmist calls out to all of these groups of people, any who haven't put your faith 
in the Lord, any who haven't trusted in him, do it right now. That's what he's saying, you know. Put your faith in Jesus, his finished work, his redemption that he purchased for us, and trust in the Father for his great love for you. He's the only one worthy of our praises. He's the only one worthy of our faith, of our trust. And the only one that I want to become like. I've heard about some of these other gods. I want nothing to do with them or to be like them in any way, you know? And now here's the promise for those who have trusted in him. In verse 12, it says, the Lord has been mindful of us. Doesn't that just that idea blow you away? You're on his mind. You know, I was listening to a, a great old Bible teacher one time, and he says, God thinks about you more than you think about you. Now, that's pretty, uh, pretty crazy, because I think about me a lot, you know. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Do you find yourself on that list? Then he will bless, he will bless, he will bless not because you earn it, not because you deserve it, but because it is his heart to bless you. Rick Brown used to talk about, you just want to get under the spout where the blessings pour out. I always imagine the shower, you know, and you want to be standing in the shower under the spout because you can be in the shower but not under the spout and you're just getting the steam and the little splashy stuff on your feet you're not really getting you know all of it you can be out by the sink you know wiping the steam off and doing something with the sink instead of being in where the blessings are pouring as christians we want to be right there wherever the blessings are pouring out that's where we want to be we just want to keep our lives right there how do you do that become a worshiper of God. That is where the blessings pour out. Not an attender, not a Bible studier. There's nothing wrong with those things. A worshiper. That's, that's where it comes. He says in verse 14, May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. You ever wonder why are we here on planet earth? Because God has made you a gift. He's given you this earth. Now, this earth is really his and everything on it, but he's handed it to you, you know, all of its beauty, its seasons, its resources, all the goods and all the bads, go be blessed and enjoy it. That's why I built it for you. <laughs> it's the place, this is the place where we worship him from. We're to be thankful here, we're to praise him here, we're to worship him here. And verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor, nor any who go down into silence. This simply, you know, we run across verses like this all the time in the Old Testament, revealing the limited revelation they had about the afterlife, what happens after death. In their thinking, at death, you went into the grave and you stayed there until resurrection morning when he calls you out, and then you would be in his presence. But through Jesus and through the New Testament, we have such more revelation than that. I mean, read Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Here's this rich man, lives lavishly, and here's Lazarus, this guy with a bunch of sores and hurts and aches and pains, and he, he just begs at the gate, just hoping to eat the scraps that fall from this rich guy's table. And they both die on the same day. And one is buried and goes down to Hades. Hades is simply that holding cell. It's like county lockup before you go to the big house, you know. Before hell is open, because hell isn't open yet. 
you go to county lockup. Oh, you're destined to go there, but there's still a judgment and some things that need to take place. But then Lazarus dies, and he goes to Abraham's bosom. He goes to paradise. And when Jesus died on the cross and paid for the sins of the whole world, all of the Old Testament people who believed, who were waiting in Abraham's bosom, it says Jesus goes there and takes captivity. They were captive in that place, captive, and takes them to the Father. And now they, without their bodies, but their spirit and their souls are with the Lord in the air. And then one day, very soon, Jesus will come back with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and will call all of the dead out of their graves. All of those old bodies will be reformed, renewed, upgraded, and then meet their souls, their spirits in the Lord's presence. And the next moment, he calls every believer off planet Earth. A physical resurrection it's a physical transformation, and it all happens in the twinkling of an eye. That's not the blink of an eye. That's really, really fast. I mean, imagine the shock waves that are going to be going, because we know there are earthly principles involved. It's going to be a noisy day. Verse 18 but we will bless the Lord from this time forth forevermore. Praise the Lord. What a great reminder for us that we become like the God we worship. Is it a car? Are you going to become rusty, older, creaky? You know? Is it, you know, celebrity? Is it fame? Is it money? What is the master passion of your life, can I suggest tonight you change whatever that is and make it the Lord? Or you can still have other passions. It just doesn't have to be the master passion. You know, when I was building my little truck, I, from the time I was about 12, I wanted a street rod. Because the guy behind me had a 55 Chevy and it was all hopped up and he would pull up to our stop sign right next to our house and pull wheelies away from there. And I was all into it. And then I really liked little old trucks and I had all of these ideas. And so as I was building my truck, I made it my aim. This is always the last thing I do. It's when I have nothing else to do. Because I knew in my heart, if I let it, this thing will own me. Because I get owned really easily. You know, I like golf for a few years. And you can ask my wife, I lived. She wanted me just to move there. Take the camp trailer, go live there, you know. You interrupt us when you come back, you know. Like that. The master passion of your life, what is it? Maybe I should say, who is it? Right? I want to become more like Jesus. That's a lot of work. Not for me, but for the Holy Spirit who is transforming me. That's a, that's a huge idea. Father, we just uh, thank you for your word. God, I ask you to, to just continue that work. Lord, would you search our hearts? Show us what and who our master passion is. And Lord, give us grace and mercy and your truth to help direct us to you. God, that we would become worshipers and stand under that spout where the blessings pour out and allow you just to, uh, to have your way. Lord, bless us this week. Encourage us. Give us a few divine appointments. Lord, send us out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.